Good morning. Good morning. Good morning Everybody morning, say good morning. Good morning. <laughs> hey, guys. We're about to get into the Bible here. Um, honey, this all started from a family Bible study, right? Yes. And what we were enjoying it so much, we said we should give this to the people. But normally, right. we all read together. Yes. This one is uh, usually drawing the picture about Jesus. Is that right? And then Christine and you read the Bible in English and Thai, right? Yes. But now, because I'm doing this series of <laughs> study, you guys kind of go and read and watch my teaching later. Is that right? right. And so anyway, uh, I just want to tell you guys, we're doing this as a model for families so that families can get in the word, right? Because when you, and we try to do it first thing in the morning, right? Emily goes to, said today, Dad, can I do it later? <laughs> right? <laughs> and what did I say, baby? What did I say? She doesn't know. <laughs> I said, I, 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 yeah, it's good to do it first thing in the morning. We can't always do that, but it's best to push for that. And I encourage that. So anyway, I just wanted, I, I just think these guys are so cute. So I wanted to say hi. And, and this, and if you don't have a family, then just study and be part of our family and enjoy yeah. the teaching together. And if you, um, if you do have a family, let this be part of your family Bible study and try to do it first thing in the morning if you can. All right. And you can. <laughs> okay. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. All I'll right. See you, see you all a little bit later. Okay. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Let's see what's on this <laughs> so we are no longer, you may notice that we've changed um, kind of where we're filming from uh, because uh, we were in Los Angeles, but there are riots. We were like right in the epicenter of the riots there. And so a sweet lady just said, hey, you can come stand at our house in Las Vegas, you know, for a while. And so that's what we're doing. And, you know, um, we're we're so blessed to be able to do that. And and now today's kind of a special day because um, we are entering into uh, the the book of Luke. And so um, by entering into the book of Luke, we are starting a new chapter now. Remember the synoptic gospels, not trying to use fancy words, but the synoptic gospels, it's the same root word as synonym, um, Mark, Luke, and Matthew. These are the synoptic gospels. John has a real different viewpoint, and so he's not part of the synoptic gospels. He's kind of a fourth appendage there, and we'll do that book after this one. Um, but we, we cover several of the same or similar things in Luke that we did in Matthew and Mark. But it's good to still get a pr fresh perspective. In Greek, the book of Luke is called kata lukian. Lukian is the Greek word for Luke. And kata means according to. So we all have a different perspective. You know, Matthew had a different perspective. Mark had a different perspective. All, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, assembled in the canon. But Luke has a different perspective. Luke was a medical doctor. He also wrote the book of Acts, which all... Pentecostal spirit-filled people love, of course. <laughs> Everybody loves. All Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians love. But anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance to study your word. Help us dive in. And Lord, let it correct us, shape us, change us, inform us, um, elevate us, bring us revelation, and help us develop and grow for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right. Luke chapter 1, verse 4. We'll get... We'll kind of start there. Again, let me say this too. One, you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And even if you don't catch us live on here, you'll be able to, you know, um, you'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, see us, you know, on YouTube. So we have Matthew already, Mark already done, Matthew already done. And you'll be able to, to, uh, to, to enjoy Luke. We're going to go all the way through the Bible, just studying. It's so important to study the Bible. So many Christians don't sort of understand uh, what Christianity is all about. They're largely shaped by church culture. They're largely sh shaped by their own culture. And when that is the case, we are not different from the world and we are not different from really the Pharisaical religion of Jesus's time. Um, there's, there's a thing that I call churchianity that are concepts, ideologies, and philosophies that are in churches, but they are not biblical. And then, of course, there are cultural perspectives, all kinds of perversion and gender roles, misunderstandings and all these kind of things that, you know, people adopt because they are cultural values in the culture they are living in. But they are not informed by the word of God. So um, our culture cannot dictate 
to the word of God. The word of God has to dictate to our culture. And so we have to stand up to our culture when our culture is not in agreement with the word of God. We don't really have to. I mean, it's not our job to correct people who are not Christians, but it is our job to know what Christians believe and what a biblical Christian is. And so it's so important to uh, really dive in and understand and learn the Bible. Um, there are so many misconceptions on who Jesus is, how we're called to act, who we're supposed to be as Christians, but the Bible uh, really helps inform that if we read it, which is really helpful. <laughs> so uh, as I told you, this is Luke's account. So Luke said, um, with this in mind, since I myself, verse three, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. We are, we need to be certain of these things in the Bible. We need to have clarity in our life. What does the Bible say? How are we supposed to act? How do we understand God? And there is, there are wrong doctrines, false teachings. There are, you know, flaky charismaticisms. There are all these things that there are, there are cultural pressures and understandings and all these things will be exposed uh, when we read the word of God. So that's what we're doing. So I don't think I pray. Yeah, I did pray. Okay, we'll keep going. So, so verse four, really, really, I would memorize that verse so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. When you are sitting under a teacher, you need to make sure that they are a spirit filled believer and that they are a Bible believing person. Why those two things? One, the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it takes the Holy Spirit to properly understand the Bible. You, you can't understand the Bible unless you have the Holy Spirit. And two, you have to also be a person who um, knows the scripture. Jesus said that you are, you are wrong. He rebuked the Pharisees. He says you are wrong because you don't know the scripture and the power of God. Some people know the scripture, but they don't have the Holy Spirit or the power of God to be able to properly, rightly divide the word. And so you want to be in a church and a setting where people have the Holy Spirit and also are knowledgeable of the word. Many people today who claim to have the Holy Spirit really um, have maybe have some experiences, but they um, are deluded in their thinking and immature and flaky and weird because they don't have the Bible as a foundational understanding. So we don't want to be in either one of those cases. We don't want to be a, a religious Pharisee that sort of only knows the Bible. Then we also don't want to be a, you know, a, a, a kind of a wild and wooly, um, you know, charismatic that is not grounded in the word of God. We want to be fully filled with the Holy Spirit and can experience the wildest things there are to experience in God, but at the same time grounded and rooted in the word so that we have a filter to know what is from God and what is not. A, somebody say, amen. Verse six, both of them, this is talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's uh, parents. I love the Baptist. Come on, somebody. This was the first Baptist, John the Baptist. And, uh, in verse six, it says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Now listen closely to this. Observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. What does it mean to be righteous in the sight of God? It means to observe the Lord's commands, to obey God. It doesn't mean to go to church or say, I believe. If you believe in Jesus, believe, or the word pistuo, Greek word, which is where we get the word faith. If you have faith in Jesus, that means that you rely on, trust in, and cling to. So your life is completely focused on Jesus, your obedience, your relationship with him. It's not just a mental agreement. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. No, just mentally say, yeah, it's, I'll check that. I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a, you know, Hindu. I'm, I, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. No, it means you must rely on, trust in, and cling to. Jesus said, why do you, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Jesus is not your Lord if you don't obey him. And obedience is really um, a foundational key to knowing if somebody has faith or not. If they obey the Lord, they do. If they don't, they don't. And here, um, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, John's parents, were observing and obeying the Lord's commands. So it's very, very important. Well, David, are you saying we're saved by 
works, we're not saved by works, but our salvation is displayed by works. If there are no works, there is no salvation. Not because you get salvation by works, but because when you are saved, then you will uh, just naturally produce fruit for the kingdom of God. And so, and the Bible's clear about that. So, there was one problem. These guys were righteous. Life was good. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. So they had a situation. They had a problem. They had a dilemma. And it said once when Zacharias' div uh, division was on duty, he was a priest. And they had, they had duty times to do their priestly duty. Uh, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by law according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple and burn incense. And when for the time for burning incense came, all were assembled, uh, worshipers were praying. Then the angel of the Lord came. Do you know, I, I've had angelic experiences, I don't know, less than 10 times in 20 years. So they are not everyday type occurrences. Um, I've had a really special one in Lakeland, Florida, where uh, an angelic choir sang for 50 minutes. It was recorded. Um, I had one in my college dorm room where <laughs> I'll, I'll do a whole video on that sometime. And it was whew, talk about the fear of the Lord. I mean, when angels come, you know, it's, they make a statement. And a few other times I had read one was really nice and it didn't scare me. It was quite peaceful. But anyway, Angela, Angela, if people say angels come to them every day, for most people, there might be some people that are really, you know, operate in that realm and are really gifted and special. But let's say for most people, it's a rare occurrence. And here, here, um, you know, Zechariah was a priest and the angel came. And the first thing the angel said in verse 13 is, don't be afraid. The angels, many of them stay in the presence of God. They leave the presence of God. That one in the, when I was in my dorm room that came to me. Um, came from the presence of God. I saw him in the throne and he came down. I mean, and when they do that, it's so absolutely terrifying because not because God's angry or something like that. Just the presence of God, the real raw presence of God is absolutely terrifying to mortal flesh. So here was a guy who the Bible already says was righteous. I mean, he was already righteous. And at that time, Guys, I was pursuing God and holiness the best I could. I would never watch a secular program or listen to a secular song or, you know, look twice at a girl in a wrong way or just, you know, if I would fast all the time. I would disciple. I was discipling gang members. I was doing all this preaching everywhere I could and all this kind of stuff. So I was, man, I was, I was as righteous as everything I knew to do. I was doing my best to be obedient, follow the Lord and all that. And here this angel came and it was stark, raving, terrifying. And here we see Zechariah, absolutely, you know, good guy, servant of the Lord in the Holy of Holies, releasing the incense and all of that. And here the angel comes. And the first thing the angel said is, do not be afraid. <laughs> then, he, then he says, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son. And you, are, you will call him John. So first, don't be afraid. Why? The presence of God is absolutely terrifying. If you have a depth of a level of the presence of God from the throne. I mean, guys, when I think about the fear of the Lord, and I've had, I guess, maybe three experiences where the, the, the fullness of the fear of the Lord. All I can say is we need to do everything we can to be righteous before the Lord and be holy and clean and all of that. And, you know, I've said numerous times, I'm far from sinless perfection or anything like that, but we need to pursue it the best we can because I, I sometimes feel like even most church people have no idea really who God really is. They're going to have a rude awakening. So here, Zechariah's got good news. He's got an angel. He's terrified, of course, but you've got a, a baby. You're going to have a baby and you're going to name him John. And, uh, he, he says this, he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born, verse 15. And I think it's very important to deal with the issue of alcohol very um, carefully. Um, the, later in the New Testament, it says that we should not even talk about these kind of controversial issues because it brings division and people get into carnality. So if you drink wine, drink wine. If you don't, don't. But don't. Paul said, don't even talk about it. 
don't even talk about it because these kind of subjects get people on the flesh and all that kind of stuff. Jesus ironically came eating and drinking and they called him a drunkard because he drank alcoholic beverages. John neither ate nor drank, Jesus said, and they said he had a demon. So, so Jesus was cool with drinking, but John's calling and purpose was to not. And so I think we need to respect both positions. You may be called not to ever drink alcohol, then don't do it. And you may have a grace like Jesus did, and it was fine for you and cool between you and God. Do it. But getting in fleshly discussions about these things in controversy is not from the Lord. So you need to need to be need to be cautious about that. Need to be cautious about that. So, you know, and of course, never be drunk. You know, gosh, um, the worst decisions in the world. Um, so. Yeah. Amazing encounter with with Zechariah and but in the middle of an awesome encounter verse 18 Zechariah asked the angel how can I be sure of this I am an old man and my wife is well along in years fair question right right it's a fair question right he didn't say anything wrong or whatever how can I be sure isn't that what we always say when the Lord speaks to us you know the Lord speaks to us and usually it's some kind of challenge like for me, I, I got challenged as a young Christian to go on mission trips. And I, you know, struggled extremely financially as a university student and as a seminary student for many years. And so when I were to go on a mission trip, it would be thousands of dollars. And I wouldn't know how to do it, but the Lord would tell me to do it. And it was hard for me because, you know, just surviving was a hard time for me. And so it was difficult to you know, kind of get to that place where, you know, I could believe for thousands of dollars to go minister on the mission field. And the Lord would tell me, and I would have a similar reaction. How can this be? Lord, I'm so, you know, poor, I can't pay attention, you know, and, and I'm barely trying to eat every day. And here, you know, here I am, um, you know, needing thousands of dollars and stuff. And so many times the Lord, and even when I moved from Texas to California to go to seminary, I didn't have enough money for my first apartment, but I had a word from the Lord. The Lord will tell you stuff to do. It's happened to me in giving many times. The Lord's like, give a thousand dollars, give this, give that, empty your wallet, empty your bank account many times. And it seems like um, it, when God speaks to you, it's often uh, there's a challenge with it, but also faith comes with it. So it seems like Zechariah is being reasonable. Why? I'm going to have a son. How can I? I'm old. My wife is, uh, I don't want to say she's old, but she's old. You know, and, and, you know, here's the situation. And he wasn't wrong. But when God speaks to us, there is a responsibility on behalf of the hearer to listen and obey and receive it. Please hear this, friends. This is for somebody. When we, when God speaks to us, there is an inherent response. He has an expectation that you receive it, you hear, and you obey. And if you don't, there's judgment. And here, this is what happened to Zechariah. He got judged. He asked an honest question, but he got judged because he didn't have faith, didn't trust the word of the Lord. God gets upset when you don't trust the word of the Lord. And, he, and the angel said to him, and now you will be silent and not be able to speak until this day happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. So here's, you're going to have a son. I got good news for you. I'm an angel. I'm not just some guy on the street. I'm not a dial a prophet. Give me 50 bucks. I'll give you a prophet. This is an angel showing up in the worship time, in the temple. Enough credibility there. And John doubts and God doesn't like. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when you hear the word of God, you need to hear it and obey it. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. It's, it's easy to understand. It's hard to do. And I have sympathy for John here, but God did it and he judged him. Now, he didn't judge him harshly. In the kindness of the Lord, he judged him with a term limit. He said, when these things come to pass, you'll be okay. But right now, you're getting a little spanking here. You can't talk for nine months, buddy, because you didn't believe. So God deals with us, but his mercies are still there and he was merciful. And so Elizabeth was happy. Verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she remained in seclusion. Verse 25, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. I like that. Do you know why I like that? We live in such a culture of death where babies in our country here in America are almost hunted. 
they're almost hunted, you know, by a feminist agenda and a desire to, I, you know, I won't say too much, but I know a girl that I went to school with and right now she's being pressured to get an abortion, you know, um, and, you know, it's, it's like a spirit of murder f towards infants. They make Herod look like a choir boy. Um, and it's refreshing to see Elizabeth rejoice in life and what, you know, how she loves to be a mother. I mean, she was disgraced among her amongst her people because she wasn't able to bear a child. And I'm not saying that's right at all. We shouldn't, you know, if somebody has fertility challenges, that gosh, you know, we should pray for them and that's it. Not at all make them feel shameful. But the fact that she understood fundamentally, you know, that a, a wonderful part of being a woman is to be able to give life. And we live in such a culture of death and a feminist agenda in these, these days. The most I like I don't like everything Mother Teresa taught or said, but I love what she said. She said the worst. She told Bill Clinton this to his face: the worst sin in America is abortion, and that is so true. Murder thousands of children every day. Saline solution in the womb, burning the child alive, dismembering them with scissors, cutting them up, etc. All these, you know, rough, rough, and horrible things going on in our hour today, we should speak against it. It's just like the Nazi concentration camps. what they do? They burn Jews alive. What do doctors do in abortion clinics? They burn children alive, compliant are their mothers. Um, they chop them up with scissors and vacuum them out. There's nothing, you can't clean it up. There's nothing pretty or pleasant about it. It's a spirit of death and it's ungodly. And the, the scripture corrects us in that, you know, in that wrong. And, 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 and Elizabeth shows an honorable woman's position here, valuing life, valuing motherhood. And so it says in verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of Mary, the virgin's name, a descendant of David, excuse me, the virgin's name was Mary. Now, let me stop there. And uh, I want to speak to something that I have never one time heard any minister or pastor say, but I want to, I'm going to address it. Um, they denote Mary as a virgin, which um, is, was a cultural value uh, so strongly that it was, you know, absolutely the woman's honor lived and died on this. Now, if you're a Christian and you're an unmarried woman and you're not a virgin, then you have forgiveness. God will forgive you and cleanse you and, uh, you know, take away the scorn of that sin and shame. On the other hand, I believe that we should um, have uh, a goal of people in the church being virgins till they get married. Now, full disclosure, I was not. So I'm not wagging my self-righteous finger at anyone. I am saying that we should try to bring that standard back and encourage people to do that. Another complicating factor, before we get too far in the weeds in this, I would do want to say this, that we, um, you know, in our culture today, really how our culture is set up through our educational system is that you really can't get married to you about 23 because you go to high school till you're 18, you go to university uh, until, you're, um, until you're 23, maybe get a graduate degree after that. And by like Mary, scholars believe, was 13 to 15 years old, about to get married. So historically, people got married in their teens. Why? Because biologically, um, people are, you know, reproductively ready at that time. And so our, our desire, our yearnings, our, you know, kind of like bodily, you know, need for sex and reproduction and all those things come, in, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, some people maybe even earlier. And so what we do is we put people in a difficult position of saying, look, deny your biological desires for 10 years while you get this degree. Now, what is the, what is the, oh, I don't know. What is the right answer for that? I, I wish I could tell you, I have a few thoughts. One is, you know, for my girls, I'll say guys, you know, no sex before marriage, but if you want to get married, kind of younger and go through university together. You know, that's an option. I'll try to support it the best I can. It's not, you know, it's not easy for everybody to do, but um, I think it's much better than getting in this pattern of, 
of, of having un, unmarried sex and breaking up and having unmarried sex and, and you develop a pattern and then people get married and then they have that get together and break up again and more than half of our country's marriages end in divorce and so um, it's a it's a tough situation to deal with and by no way am I shaming anyone um, the Bible says that uh, Jesus will take away our sins and and cleanse us white as snow so any kind of sexual sin whatsoever if you're a Christian and you've repented from that, then God God will cleanse you and there's no need for shame at the same time. It's kind of like divorce. Like if you're divorced and you've, you know, if it was your fault, if it wasn't your fault, you have nothing to repent of. But if you have biblical grounds for divorce, but if you don't, you know, and you messed up, you did something wrong, then you can repent. It's not the unforgivable sin and you can move on and God loves you and you can have a great life. But we should still try to figure out what are the problems that are causing divorce. You understand what I mean? So, so we need it. We need to try to have this bi biblical standard of virginity and yet also not shame and condemn people that, you know, you know, haven't gone that direction. And so I think it's, it's important to address this. I've never once heard a pastor or minister talk about that. And I do know there are some movements like true love weights and all this kind of stuff. But it, it, sometimes I feel like we put people in a double bind because, um, they, we were saying, put your biology off for 10 years so you can get a diploma when you, you know, reproductively you're ready. And I think that's why some teenagers are angry and suicidal and stuff like that, because they're not being allowed to function within their God given sort of reproductive uh, window there. And so we need to come up with some, you know, answer for this. The answer is not to just have sex, whatever you want and, you know, abort your kids and kill your kids and, and, and develop that pattern of together and break up together and break up. That's not the answer. But I don't know that just saying sit tight for 10 years until you get, you know, and shame people into doing that. I don't know that that's the answer either. I think, I think we, I wonder if we couldn't come up with an earlier marriage thing. And uh, instead of, you know, people going to university and getting all kinds of STDs and, you know, sleeping around and developing that adulterous and fornication pattern, maybe we can, maybe we can um, look to marrying younger, something like that, and just kind of supporting that idea and family and, and all that. I don't know. I don't know. I know it's a can of worms, but I, need, I felt like it needed to be addressed. The angel, verse 28, says, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Hey, Mary, 13 to 15 year old, just came home from cheerleading practice, whatever it was. And she, and he's like, what, what? I'm favored? All right, praise God, that's great. Um. You know, and uh, and Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So if you have an angel come, you're going to be scared. But the angel said to her, do, you, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants and his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Verse 34. For since I am a virgin. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Whew. So here's Mary, the young girl, and she is um, betrothed to Joseph. Um, the penalty for, you know, being betrothed to somebody and then they finding out on the wedding day night that you're not a virgin is death by Old Testament law. So here the angel said, hey, I got great news. <laughs> great news. I, look, I got some great news for you, Mary. Um, you're getting pregnant, not by Joseph, who you're betrothed to, so you could get killed for being in adultery. You're going to have a baby. And Mary's like, what? How can this happen? I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. And, you know, how can this happen? And, you know, sometimes God says things that are, that are good news, but they come with some baggage. <laughs> they come with some challenge with them. What's an example? Hey, you're going to be a prophet to the nations and you're going to speak the word of God and you're going to stand up to powerful institutions and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. In the conference, everybody claps and they're excited. And then you have to go and do it. Then you have to go prophesy and people hate you and try to kill you. Then you have to go to, you know, uh, you know, you have to tell the truth. And then people with ungodly agendas, you know, slander you. And, uh, you know, all this. The, the angel never talks about that part. <laughs> you say, hey, you're going to have a kid. It's going to be great. Just trust me. What? What? I'm going to get killed. Joseph will have, can have me stoned, you know, in the temple courts because, you know, I, I didn't keep my promise. 
And then the angel, verse 36, says, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old, in her old age, and she who is said, she who is said to be unable to conceive uh, is in her sixth month. And I love this part. The angel stamps it with this, this seal. No word from God will ever fail. Come on, somebody. No word from God. Look, I'm saying the impossible. Nobody gets pregnant by God overshadowing them. Nobody does it. No old lady, God bless her. She's an old lady past her ability to have a baby in the natural. It's going to be six months pregnant. God will throw the impossible on you. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. I can't, God. Yeah, no, you can't. You're going to do it. That's what God does many times. He'll call you to do the impossible. He'll call you to work in miracles. He'll call you to release words of knowledge. He'll call you to prophesy. He'll call you to stand up in courage when maybe you don't feel very courageous. He will call you to do things that feel impossible. No doubt Mary was grateful for the angel and the word and all that. But how am I going to pull this off? No word from God will ever fail. I love it. Somebody should be shouting right now. And also, I like that the angel says things that can be confirmed. So some people in spirit-filled circles say a lot of things and, you know, say God told me this and God told me that. But what you're going to see in this chapter, confirmation, 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 confirmation. So here's another confirmation. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, uh, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit in a loud voice. So she, the spirit of prophecy probably came on her. And she said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What is she doing? She's confirming Jesus' calling. She, she's confirming, you know, um, the fact that that Jesus is going to be the Messiah. She's, 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 it's an outside confirmation. It's an outside confirmation. So if you're hearing from God, one of the best ways <clears throat> to know that you're on track is outside confirmation. God is faithful again and again and again and again and again to confirm. And so, um, you know, Mary sings a worship song and enjoys it. Do you know what, when I was reading this, you know, verse 46, it says, Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he is mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, which is true. 2,000 years later, people call Mary, Mary blessed. But when I read this, I felt a little bittersweet. Here's this 13 to 15-year-old girl who is having an unbelievable experience, and God is confirming it, and there are angels, and there are impregnations by the Holy Spirit overshadowing it. Just really out-of-the-box stuff, but she's rejoicing. Now, but do you, you know, because we have the perspective of history, we can look um, on her situation and say, you know what, Mary, there's some trouble that's going to come with this too. Jesus is, you're going to see oil, you know, blood and water pouring from his side. You're going to have the heartbreak of watching your child die. You're going to see people dishonor him and disrespect him and slander him and all of those things. And, and because I have the advantage of, uh, uh, you know, seeing uh, what happens in her future, uh, you know, it's bittersweet when she is rejoicing because, because there's going to be a lot of pain in this situation that she is now rejoicing over you may be called to be a pastor and you're so excited and you've always wanted to be used of god and the prophet came and told you and then you got another confirmation another confirmation another confirmation but you you, you don't know all the pain that's going to come with that pastor and you don't know that sheep bite back and that you'll be misjudged and people will you know sometimes not understand you and you'll make mistakes you yourself it's not just all these people making you yourself will go hey you know you, uh, you, you, you know, you've blown it. And so you'll not only lament the mistreatment of others, you'll lament your own mistake in being a pastor. How in the world could I do it? And if you saw all the future, there it would be a little um, bittersweet tempered with that rejoicing. But you know what I thought after that? I thought, you know what? Mary's going to weep her tears at Golgotha. Mary's going to weep her tears there. But you know what? She's going to weep her tears in that moment. So why not enjoy the moment? And I would say that to everybody. Do you know, when you have a kid, if you saw 20 years down the road, you might see that kid is going to have some kind of trouble that's going to break your heart. Absol I mean, I am such a wimp. 
I, I kind of fancy myself a little bit the tough guy. But when it comes to my kids, I am a sissy. Cold weather and clowns and my kids being hurt. These things are my weakness. If you want to know, full disclosure, this, these are my weaknesses. Don't like clowns and uh, don't like the cold weather. And if my kid gets the tiniest little bit of sadness, it break absolutely breaks my heart. So knowing a parent's love for a child, you almost kind of wince when Mary is celebrating because the ugliness she's going to have to witness um, that her son will experience. It's heartbreaking. And so, you know, should we rejoice? Yeah. Do you know what? Here's what I want to say. When it's time to cry, cry. When it's time to laugh, laugh. When it's time to sing a song of praise, sing a song of praise. James, the brother of John, took the sword from Herod, ran him through and killed him. John the Baptist had his head cut off. But here is Elizabeth celebrating the fact that she's having a kid. And you know what? She should. Her son was greatly used by God. Incredible. Incredible. Right? So it's a blessing, but there is pain also. But you know what? When you're when it's time to cry, cry. When it's time to laugh, laugh. When it's time to praise, praise. When it's time to lament, lament. When it's time to cry, cry. You know, do do whatever it is and fully feel that emotion in that season. Don't let the worry and fear of what may come next. Well, I don't want to be too happy, David, because my marriage is good right now. But gosh, guess what? A lot of people have a lot of trouble. Maybe I shouldn't be so happy. No, enjoy it now. Well, I love my little kids, but God, when they grow up and they start dating, I'm going to go crazy. Just enjoy them now. Because if there is pain later, at least you have the joy now. Don't take away from the joy now. Later. Also, a little pet peeve of mine when somebody dies in a Christian's life, they say, well, we, but we don't we don't grieve because there's those who have no hope. Which is true, but grieve. Like, don't feel bad or like you have to apologize for crying or, or, or being sad that that person is no longer with you. Grieve. Do whatever in that moment is appropriate emotion for that moment. And so here Mary's celebrating. Then go ahead, sing that song, Mary. Sing that song. Celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate it. Celebrate. You have this moment. Okay, you're going to cry later? Then cry later, but celebrate now. Enjoy it. Amen? Amen. Now, verse 59, we're back to Zechariah. On the eighth day, he came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother said, no, his name will be called John. And they said, because people usually name their kids after a relative, they said, no, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. And then they made signs to the father of what he would like to name the child. Zachariah, what do you want? Because he can't talk, remember? And he start, he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, his name is John. Then immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was set free. His mouth was open and his tongue was set free. The judgment that he got by disobedience or lack of faith he was healed by being obedient. Let me let me give this principle. So do you notice that the angel said that after your son is born, you, you're going to be able to talk again. But John was eight days old, time to get circumcised, and he still wasn't talking. So the concern was that, hey, the angel said after the baby's born, I'm going to talk now, I still can't talk. So it was eight days later, it gave John a little extra time to think about it. But the judgment that he brought on himself from wrong actions, lacking faith, not believing, not trusting what the angel said, he broke through based on right actions. Let me say this. You can't pray yourself out of an ungodly situation that you acted your way into. Let me say that again. You can't pray yourself out of an ungodly situation that you acted your way into. You must act your way out of that ungodly situation. Here, Zachariah didn't pray for God to open up his tongue. He acted his way out. If you have done wrong, for example, let's say you don't tithe, okay? David, you just talk about tithing because you're a preacher and you want money. I don't receive the tithe. The tithe goes to the storehouse, to the church, not to me. But let's say you were, you're not tithing, right? And you're disobeying God and there's a curse on you and Malachi chapter three is taking place on your life. So you're not tithing and you can't just pray and say, God, forgive me for not tithing and then keep not tithing. You have to act your way out of the thing that you have done wrong. You can't just pray your way out or ask for forgiveness or, you know, if you have some sexual sin or something, you keep doing it again and again and again. You can't 
pray oh just say i'm sorry every time and i don't know what to do you have to act your way out of it you got to stop putting yourself in those positions you got to take aggressive action against it so sometimes i think that we just feel like yeah i messed up again i need to pray about you don't need to pray you need to act so when you're tempted to go into that sin again you need to stop i had a, a friend in seminary and she uh she couldn't stop smoking no <laughs> it's kind of funny because she was like a really on fire prophet i mean she would come up with stuff that was just incredible, but she was addicted to smoking cigarettes and she knew it was sin, you know, for her. And so, so, you know, cause it's bad for your body, you know, and, and, and she felt convicted and she wanted to stop, but she couldn't stop. And I told her, I said, at the height of the next time that you're tempted to go to 7-Eleven, buy a pack of smokes or whatever, then you need to rebuke that and say, in Jesus name, devil, I'm not going to do it. Boom. And she did that thing. She acted and she resisted the devil and he fleed from her. And to my knowledge, she never smoked again, after, smoked again after that. But you have to act your way. You can't just pray. She, she did rebuke the devil, but then she also resisted. She took action. So if you're if you're having some kind of sin problem, maybe it's your anger. Maybe you need to go to an anger management class. Maybe the court has not ordered it for you. You can probably take one online, but you need to learn about that. Some of the roots and get some practical keys. Don't just pray, Lord, please help. Take some practical steps. Act your way out of it. Maybe you really have an anger problem or a violence problem. You gotta, you got to act your way out of it. Zechariah acted his way out of it by obeying the Lord and calling him John. And then he got his breakthrough. Some of your breakthrough won't come until you act your way out of it. So somebody say amen. Uh, all right. So in, in chapter 2, Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth uh, to Bethlehem because they were doing a census. And uh, he went there to register Mary, who was pledged to him to be married and was expecting a child. While they were there, uh, the time came and she gave birth to the baby. She wrapped him in clothes, verse 7, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So people think that he, she just went to a barn. She didn't go to a barn. They had um, they had kind of like, I don't know what you would call it, but they had, a, they had uh, traveling caravans. For those traveling caravans, they would have... Uh, places to put the animals at night because they wouldn't often travel at night and there would be like a little place to stay there it's sort of i don't know what you would compare it to today but maybe a, a hotel that allows dogs or something like that but anyway it wasn't just a random one they, they had these places all along traveling destinations and stuff and so there was no proper hotel which would have been the preferred place so but they, so they went to this place where animals were kept for people on caravans and traveling etc and so so uh, there she was in the manger, a humble place. You know, big things start in small places. Azusa Street Revival, small place, not fancy people, poor people, people that didn't have much. And God used them mildly and greatly. Big things happen in small places. Billy Graham started preaching, um, you know, in his in the woods at his Bible school. Nobody would listen to him. So he just started preaching to the trees and he started telling them to repent. And they came to the altar. No, I'm just kidding. But that big things. And then he preached before the biggest crowds in the world. Big things happen in small places. Billy Graham didn't know that when he was preaching in the woods to the trees, that a million people would come in Seoul, Korea, largest Christian meeting in the history of the world at that time. Big things happen in small places. God uses people. Joyce Myers, largest women's ministry in the world. You know, she... You know, she she I don't know what size it is, but she touches millions of people every single day. And uh, the blessing is incredible and all, all of that stuff. And she started in a living room preaching. She never would have thought that she would be the most influential woman leader in the world, Christian world. Probably she was in a Bible study. What big things happen in small places. And so don't despise the humble beginnings wherever you are. God doesn't look at that. He's looking at your heart. Jesus started out in a pretty modest place. He was in a place where animals were kept. And so God can use you in the same way. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and the glory of the Lord showed around them. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid. I bring you good news <laughs> that will cause great joy for all people. Good news, guys. Today, uh, this is this is. The angels, excuse me, talking about the shepherds, verse 8, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. So the angels came out to these shepherds, again, 
humble people, simple people. David, what if I'm really rich and famous and successful? Does that mean God doesn't love me? I'm not saying that at all. God can bless everyone who has a heart for him. So you don't need to, you know, kind of get upset about that or anything like that. But it is a good word for people who are in a humble position because God repeatedly again and again uses people in humble positions. So no matter where you are or you feel like you don't fit in or you feel like you're not enough, you're the wrong color, you're the wrong gender, you're wrong this, wrong that, know that God, shepherds were not fancy people in those days. That was kind of a low level job. This was a, you know, uh, the minimum wage type situation and they were sleeping outside, not fancy. Mary's in the manger, not fancy, but God used them. And so, you know, there's an empowering word for us there. And so the angels came and then the angels left them in verse 15 and gone to heaven. And the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this. They did not just hear the word from the angel, but they acted on it. Isn't it funny? The shepherds listened to the angel. The priest, Zechariah, did not. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Sometimes us pastors, ministers, and leaders, we, we can be a little dull. We can be a little dense. And, you know, the, 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 the people who maybe don't have a position of authority or leadership kind of can teach us a thing or two. And so that's what happened here. And they went. They took action. Friends, I want to tell you something. It's much better to hear little things from the Lord or know a little bit of the Bible and apply it than to know everything and do nothing. Be a person of action. This will be this will serve you well if you do that. And so they came in uh, to the temple because they were supposed to give offerings for Jesus's birth. And it said, now a man called Simeon, who was righteous and devout, he was waiting for the uh, consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. And he had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to him, uh, Simeon took him and praised God. He said, Sovereign Lord, you have promised, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light, I love this description of Jesus. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. Somebody say that's me. And a glory of your people, Israel. Jesus was, came to be a blessing for everyone. Somebody say amen. Jesus came for the whole world. Not everybody will choose him, but he came for everyone. He loved everyone. His purpose was for everyone. But what I want you to see too is again, another confirmation. This guy Simeon didn't know, didn't know Jesus, didn't know Mary, didn't know Joseph. And yet another confirmation. Whenever God is really doing something in your life, he'll confirm and confirm and confirm and confirm and confirm. All right. Don't be a rebellious you know, Lone Ranger Christian who says, I'm the only one who hears from God. Nobody else does. Friends get confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. God's happy to do it. It's not that you have a lack of faith. He just wants you to know for big things, especially that you're on the right track. Um, verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And, and uh, you know, the, Simeon blessed them and said, this child is des destined to uh, be the rise and fall of many, to be a sign which will be spoken against so that the thoughts and hearts will be revealed and a sword too will pierce your own soul. Some foreshadowing, Mary and Joseph. This is a glorious moment, but there's also some stuff coming that you want to, you want to, you know, be aware of. Verse 36, there was also a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years. Let's say she was 15 when she got married. She lived with her husband till she was 22 and uh, then was a widow until she was 84. It's a sad life. Probably 62 years she had lived alone. Here's this lady devoted to the Lord, a prophetess, faithful in the temple, and, you know, just loving God. And there she is, you know, um, you know, having pain, but she turned her pain into power. She turned her pain into relationship with the Lord. I think this is a really important key. How hurtful. Do you, do you guys, you know, we kind of marry and divorce like it's nothing here. But, you know, in these times, a woman really had one shot. She really had one chance to sort of have a family and all of that. And she had a window, you know, of, of time where she could have a kid. And it was so important to her. And, you know, she was betrothed and got married and was with her husband seven years and got no doubt got close to him and doesn't mention any kids or anything like that. But ever since then, she just, you know, obviously she had heartbreak. And she just stayed in the temple. She just stayed close to the Lord. Can I tell you something, friends? If you have heartbreak, stay close to the Lord. That's what she did. And you know what? God used her to do what? Confirm again. If you think you're the Messiah, there's a couple of guys around the world. There's a guy in the Philippines, guy in Russia, 
guy in England, guy in Mexico, they all think they all tell everybody the Jesus, you know, you need to get some confirmation from angels before you think you're the Messiah. There's only one Messiah. His name is Jesus Christ. There'll never be another one. There never was never one before him. He's the only one. There are a lot of fakers, but here, um, another confirmation. God used this lady. God used this lady's pain. You know, she just had a normal life and kind of went through life. She'd be fine, but God used her pain and turned it into power. And she confirmed for Mary and Joseph. Because Mary and Joseph had to go through a lot of stuff. They needed this confirmation. And she just stayed in the temple and worship, fasting and praying. I mean, godly, godly lady. And she she prophesied about him. Verse 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. This idea of Jesus' connection with the Passover, the Passover actually prophesied Jesus. The Passover lamb's blood was put over the door so the angel of judgment would not take the first sons and, and kill. Do you, do you know the Passover really speaks of protection from death? And while in the Passover time in Egypt, when, when, when God's people were in exile, that was a physical death. But Jesus' blood was shed for our spirit, for, to keep us from spiritual death. And so there's such a beautiful connection between Jesus and the Passover. And it's there's so much richness if we can understand those things. Um, after three days, they found him in the temple. They had lost Jesus. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like that? I can understand that statement. If my kids like snuck away for three days, I it would kill me. I, I don't know how they even survived, kept their mental faculties together. Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. How scared would you feel if that happened? And Jesus said, why are you, were you searching for me? My kids better not say that. Jesus can't know. <laughs> didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Jesus will speak in mystery to us today. And he did all the way back through his first recorded words here. To his parents jesus will leave does leave some mystery on the table he doesn't explain everything fully some things have to be searched out that's the beauty of walking with the lord he went down to nazareth but his mother this is a neat phrase in verse 51 his mother treasured all these things in her heart you know this is the only time in the bible that this is used this phrase and eh, treasure it means it's it's dietario in the Greek, it means to store or protect or safeguard. And do you know when the Lord does something in our lives, we do, we shouldn't be flippant about it. We should treasure these things, safeguard these things, um, lock them away in our hearts. And there's almost, I, my understanding on it is that there's almost like a ruminating that we need to chew on these things. It's very, very important. And so anyway, I love that phrase. It's the only time it's used in the Bible like that. And it's precious. Verse 52, the last verse. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That's a, a well-known verse that we need to, of course, stature just means it's growing up. Wisdom. Jesus grew in wisdom. Some people get upset when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they say, do I need a second work of grace? Wasn't my salvation enough in Jesus? But, you know, friends, Jesus grew. We should continue to grow. We need to continue to grow. Um, and, you know, grow in God's favor, grow in wisdom. We all, if Jesus had to grow, how much more do we have to grow to be sanctified, to be purified, to, to gain revelation, wisdom, and understanding? We need to see Jesus as our example. If he had to grow, we have to grow. Can you say amen? So I love you guys, and uh, I'm excited about teaching the Word of God. If, if this has been a blessing to you, please share it. And uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And that way you can get all of these right when they come out. All right. Father, bless every person watching. Um, Lord, uh, increase them in their understanding of who you are as a person. And all of us, me too. And so we can just know you more and give you praise and be uh, not only a hearer, but a doer of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys.